The grace and love of our Lord and Savior be with us always. Amen. The word of God we want to consider today is our Old Testament reading for this past Sunday, which was the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, the worship of the wise men of the infant Jesus. We're looking at Job chapter 7, verses 1 to 7, where Job says, Does not man have hard service on earth? Are not his days like those of a hired man? Like a slave longing for the evening shadows or a hired man waiting eagerly for his wages. So I have been allotted months of futility and nights of misery have been assigned to me. When I lie down, I think how long before I get up. The night drags on and I toss till dawn. My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. My dear friends in Christ, you'd have to say that Job's book, the book is a strange book because for some reason, Satan was allowed to come into God's presence. And while in God's presence, God pointed Satan to Job and talked about what a fine believer he was. He said, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan replied to Job about that and replied to God about Job and said to him, God, the only reason that Job is such a, a fine believer is because you've blessed him so much. He has such great wealth and possessions. He has a large family. He has his health. He has everything. But then Satan said, if you take that away, he won't be the fine believer anymore. And God did give Satan the right to take away all of those blessings that Job had received, but not his life, not his life. And so Job lost all of those things. And he, he lost his possessions, his wealth, his health. And his wife turned against him. His kids, they were killed. His wife turned against him and his friends, they condemned him. They said that basically, the only reason you're suffering now is because you must have committed some sort of a really terrible sin that now God is so angry with you that he's taking all of those blessings away. Our reading, it's part of Job's response to Eliphaz. And now Eliphaz was one of the friends that, so-called friends that Job had, who ended up kind of turning on him and saying, Boy, what you need to do is you need to confess whatever the terrible sin is that you've committed and stop complaining, but start confessing. And then what will happen is that God will remove your suffering. But now that was heartless and totally wrong judging on the part of Eliphaz. And that wrongful judging like that triggered a predictable response from Job when Job basically asked the question, isn't mortal man's life tough enough without God making it even more miserable? The book of Job is a book that poses a perplexing problem on us that believers often will ask Believers will often ask the question, why is it that it seems like believers end up suffering so much in this life while those who are unbelievers seem to have everything going their way? They maybe are the more wealthy and the more successful people in this life, maybe. But that question, why does this happen? Well, you look at it and what it tells us is Job was a righteous man. His faith and his patience are exemplary. And his suffering, it wasn't sent as a punishment from God because of a sin, 
but as a wholesome chastisement or discipline, a teaching moment for Job in his life and for us as well, a teaching moment to prove and test and purify his faith. In the final analysis, all of Job's sufferings, they really end up serving the glory, the praise, and honor of God himself. It was not because Job committed some sort of a, a terrible sin that his life was afflicted with this exemplary, extraordinary suffering, but because the Lord, in his sovereign majesty, chose to send these measures into his life to greatly benefit Job and us, to teach Job and us a great spiritual lesson. Job asked, Does not man have hard service on earth? Are not his days like those of a hired man, like a slave longing for the evening shadows, or a hired man waiting eagerly for his wages? In the opening verses of the book of Job, we're told that Job had been the greatest man among all the people of the East. And now he's this most frail and mortal man with nothing but hard life to face. He was in a, from an earthly perspective, an absolutely terrible situation. He pictures himself as a slave or a worker with nothing but struggles in this life and, and he just wasn't making it. Everything was going wrong. And since the fall into sin, we human beings are frail and weak creatures. And this contrasts the caricature that humanism draws of us when it says, you have the inner strength to conquer all life's obstacles. Be courageous and you will rise above it. You have a mind, figure everything out and trust your reason. Work hard enough, you can get on top. That's kind of what humanism says. But with this kind of human logic, humanism tries to persuade us that we can be the masters of our destiny, the masters of our own fate. But Job says here, I have been allotted months of futility and nights of misery have been assigned to me. The effects of sin. We're not the master of our destiny. We can't control our lives or our destiny. The Apostle Paul said, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in this way death came to all men because all sin. The result of Adam and Eve's sin were painfully evident to Job. Life in this sin-filled world is tough. Have you ever felt like Job did? Well, most likely there are times when you've had sufferings and trials and troubles, but probably, probably nowhere near like what Job ended up going through. He struggled, we struggle at times as well, maybe a lot of times for that matter, but what gave Job hope and strength was the promises of God. Later in his book, in his book, in the book, a suffering Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another, how my heart yearns within me. That's always what gives the Christian hope. Life is tough, but we have Jesus. We have the promises of God. And that means joy even now in our sufferings and joy forever in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. As we go through much tribulation in this life, help us always to remember the joy we have now in Jesus and the joy we'll have forever in heaven because in Jesus we do have true lasting happiness. We pray in his name. Amen. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us always.